Hello Bruins, welcome to Choreograph Your Life, a three-part leadership series led by Ms. Val. My name is Gloria Ko, proud 2006 graduate, and I serve as the Senior Director of Alumni Career Engagement at UCLA Alumni Affairs. We're thrilled to have you with us today for this intimate conversation style program. The series is designed for Bruins wanting to learn from Ms. Val's pillars of success and who hope to gain insights from her professional journey. We're thankful for many of you who submitted questions during registration and we'll be answering some of these questions throughout the program. Today's session will be around the climb and how to embrace opportunity and prepare yourself for new endeavors. For some housekeeping, we ask participants to use the Q&A function below and not the chat during the event if you have a question for Ms. Val. And, if, and we will be able to answer some of your questions at the end of the program. We will also be sending out a link of the recording in the next week or so for those that are interested in re-watching or sharing the program. Lastly, for those that have joined us today, we'll let you know of additional opportunities to engage with Ms. Fowl throughout the course of the three-part series. So look out for emails from our team. The UCLA Alumni Association strives to provide relevant and helpful career programming. So be sure to check out resources and offerings at alumni.ucla.edu slash careers. And also be sure to connect with other Bruins on UCLA One, our online professional community. For Bruins, uh, where you can search for jobs, request informational interviews, and mentor a student. You can sign up today at UCLA1.com. Uh, UCLA so on to our program. I'm happy to introduce Wendy Soderberg from the class of 1982, who will be interviewing Ms. Val tonight. She served as senior editor in UCLA's Office of Strategic Communications, where for many years, she was the managing editor of UCLA Magazine. We hope today's conversation will inspire you to take the first or next steps in your personal and professional journey. Thank you, Wendy, for, for being our esteemed interviewer, and thank you to Ms. Val for sharing her time and inspiration with us today. Now take it away, Wendy. Hi, everyone. My name is Wendy Soderberg, and I'll be serving as your moderator for this three-part series. Many times over the last several years, I have had uh, the privilege of interviewing this remarkable woman that I'm about to introduce. And if I were to sit here and list every single award and honor and accolade that she has earned over the years, we would be here all night. So I'm just going to touch on a few of the highlights. Uh, as you know, she is the former head coach of the UCLA women's gymnastics team, a position that she held for 29 years until her retirement last June. She has led her teams to seven NCAA championship titles. In 2010, she was named one of only two active coaches to be inducted into the UCLA Athletics Hall of Fame. And in 2016, she was named the Pac-12 Gymnastics Coach of the Century. Not just Coach of the Year or Coach of the Decade, but Coach of the Century. And in 2018, she wrote her first book, um, a inspirational work called Life is Short, Don't Wait to Dance. Her friends, family, colleagues, and former gymnasts all know her to be a passionate leader and an insightful life coach, and I'm sure that you will too. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Valerie Condos Field. Hi, everybody. Hi, Bruins. Hey, Miss Val. How are you? I am great. Great. Thank you. Um, I'm just wondering how you've been holding up in these times of social unrest and COVID-19. I know, you know, I think that, I think we're probably all experiencing the same emotions on different varying levels. Like every single day, I'm <clears throat> extremely grateful for what I have. I'm sad for what's going on. I feel super sad for people that um, are really struggling. Uh, and all of these emotions like this, but then, you know, I come back to gratitude for the fact that, wow, look at the time that I have at home with my husband and all these people that I, I get to reach out to like you and the Bruins that are here with us today. But for the last three months, um, I purposefully, mindfully put my mind to something that I had heard uh, early on in, in the three months. And it was, um, are you, and it was a question, are you spending your time or are you investing your time? And I was like, okay, this is good. And so I thought, 
okay, I'm going to choose to invest this time. And back then, like March 13th, we didn't know how long this was going to last. You know? Okay, it's going to be two weeks. I'm going to invest <laughs> my time. <laughs> Then a few weeks later, I heard kind of the same thing, only with different words. And it said, um, another question, are you getting through this time or are you growing through it? And so the last five years, I've been on this treadmill that's been like going crazy. I've said yes to everything. I have had zero downtime. And I have chosen to grow through this. And I've worked on calming myself. I've worked on really trying to figure out what I want to do in this next chapter. So that's a really long answer for the question of how I'm getting through this COVID time. <laughs> nope, that's exactly what I wanted to know. <laughs> okay, well, let's, let's start with the, with the questions. Um, um, I'd like you to tell us a little bit about your, your childhood and your roots. I know that you spent many summers as a child with your family in Greece, and I'm wondering um, and your, with your scoliosis diagnosis as well, how did that shape your outlook on life and lead you to pursue dance? And maybe you could tell people what scoliosis is as well, because some people may not know. So, okay, we'll do. Um, and as we're talking about people, I just want to say thank you all for joining us. I know that we've all kind of been zoomed out and webinared out these last three months. So I understand that there's over 800 of us on line right now and I wish that we could just have this massive chat all together um, so thank you thank you all for being there mm -hmm. here with us um, right my family's from Greece little teeny tiny village in southern Greece it's called Amos and it's near Kalamata where the olives are from Kalamata olives and I remember being four years old oh there I am that's the dog that I named Maria <laughs> Um, I remember being four years old and being in the village with my family and it's like they had dirt floors. You had to go outside to get on the, to get into the outhouse to use the toilet. You had to, you'd had to have a stick and you had to hit the rooster to be able to get into the outhouse. Um, but I remember thinking growing up how cool it was that my family didn't, they didn't think they were poor. That really stayed with me. And so there was this loving, vibrant vi vitality that I experienced living with my family in the village where, you know, in every moment they're singing, they're dancing, they're, and it's this, I mean, I'm talking village. There were 30 homes in this village. So that really stayed with me um, my whole life, that perception is reality. Their perception was that they were rich and they were. They had everything they needed. Um, then we came back to the States and the doctors did find that I have scoliosis and it's a curvature of the spine. It's not severe, but it is definite. And the doctors just said it would be best if she could strengthen the muscles around her spine. And the best things to do that would be gymnastics or dance, ballet. And I wanted to do gymnastics <laughs> And my parents said, no, you're going to do ballet. And I don't know why they said that. But um, so I started dancing when I was six, uh, six and a half. And I danced until I was 22. And the important part of that, that story is that I had a tremendous career in, as a professional ballerina, but I was not built to be a ballerina. I mean, I've got strong, thick Greek thighs. <laughs> I have very small feet for a ballerina. Ballerinas, the longer your feet, the more beautiful they are. And I remember going to auditions, Wendy, and I remember, because you stand there, you know, you're like this, and they go down the line. And more, like, more times than not, I would get, your head is too big and your neck is too short. And I remember yeah. going, <laughs> like, how am I supposed to make my head smaller? So, but so many times, either the director of the company or the choreographer would say, you know what? You have no flexibility. You have no turnout. You don't have the body of a ballerina and your head is too big, but it's obvious that you love to dance. And that's the reason why I got cast 
in so many ballets. They said, you come alive on stage. Mm. Nice. Very nice. Yeah. Um, how did you, how did that shape your outlook? Would you say this, this, I mean, it was difficult, I'm sure, to be told you have scoliosis. Even your parents telling you that you, they wanted you to be a ballet dancer rather than a gymnast. How did that sort of shape your, your outlook on the future, even at that early age? I just remember being at the bar, the ballet bar, and the, the girl in front of me was, you know, that big, and her leg is up here, and my leg's down there, and I was this misfit. I was a total misfit. But I remember just thinking, but I love to dance. Oh, I know what it was, actually. These thoughts are coming to my mind. I remember being in the wings and getting ready to go on stage. And I was so excited to go on stage. And in the wings, there were buckets for the dancers that got so nervous that they needed to throw up before they went on stage. Mm -hmm. And then going back into the ballet class with these beautiful, tall, skinny ballerinas. And I remember thinking, how sad it is that they're so stressed out over performing, you know, because performance is a celebration of all of your hard work. And so um, that kind of allowed me not to focus on the fact that my head was too big and my neck was too short. <laughs> How dare they say that? <laughs> oh, they did. Yeah, they did. Okay. Well, um, let me ask you, um, Early on in your career, uh, who inspired you to pivot from dance to gymnastics? How did that come about? Honestly, I did. Uh, it was 1976. I was a junior in high school, and I wanted a summer job. And I now I still never lost my love of gymnastics. I remember Olga Corbett and just thinking she was uh, it. It girl. Mm -hmm. um, I contacted a local gym and I asked them if the head coach, if they needed a dance coach for their, for their gymnasts. And in the course of our conversation, he, we were talking and he found out that I played the piano and I have as much classical piano training as I do ballet training. And he's, and okay, for all of you historians out there, um, <laughs> you're laughing at my hair and no makeup. yes you are that's <laughs> a lot of hairspray and a lot of makeup that was my <laughs> two okay so we fast forward a little bit here go back to 1976 i'm in high school and um he just found out that i played the piano oh i was giving you a history lesson before 1980 if, if you ever this is good for trivial pursuit okay before 1980, floor music for gymnasts could only be one instrument. It could mm -hmm. not be orchestrated. So it was usually the piano. And every once in a while, these avant-garde gir avant girls would have drums or the guitar. But it was usually the piano. And we had compulsories. And so, mm -hmm. and compulsories were played live. So I would play piano. And if anybody knows me, okay, I can't keep my big mouth shut when I have something to say. So I would be playing and then I would just stop. I'm like, not in competition, but in training. And I'm like, your feet are, are flexed. Their feet are supposed to be pointed. Point your feet. And then the coach would be like, you're supposed to be playing the piano, not coaching. So that's really how I got into it. And then I don't remember how, but I remember the next summer, they let me choreograph a routine. And I remember so distinctly it was for sydney jones and i remember so much of that routine it was horrible because i had no <laughs> idea what i was doing <laughs> but that's really how i got into it okay so you really you just took the bull by the horns yourself it wasn't any one person who said you know you should go into gymnastics or okay yeah. okay um now, this is, uh, this is interesting. I, I, I hope you tell us all about this. The Art of the Ask, which is something you mentioned in your book. And can you tell us what the Art of the Ask is? That's A-S-K. And yes. give us some personal examples. I like how you spelled ask. <laughs> <laughs> Thank I thought you. I was saying something else. <laughs> the Ask. <laughs> that was great. Um, the Art of the Ask is uh 
if you look at things that you've done in your life, um, it all starts with an ask. Ask. I was, it was 1982. I was professionally dancing ballet. I heard via the grapevine that UCLA needed a dance coach for their gymnastics team. And I had not gone to college yet. I was 22 years old. And um, <clears throat> without any hesitation, I found out who the head coach was, Jerry Tomlinson, got his number, picked up the phone, told him my resume as a dancer, and I made the ask. I would love to be your dance coach choreographer if you need one. Mm -hmm. And he, I'll never forget when he said, if you've not gone to school yet, we would we can give you a full scholarship. We don't have a salary to give you, but I can give you a full scholarship to go to school. And I was like, done. And I retired mm -hmm. like that. I moved, I was dancing in DC, Washington, DC. I moved to Los Angeles and started this whole career. And so when I look at this illustrious, amazing opportunity I had at UCLA in the sport of gymnastics, none of this would have happened if I would have been too fearful to make the ask. Um, the next ask came in 1998. I had married Bobby Field, who was our football defensive coordinator, and he knew Coach Wooden, and I did not know Coach Wooden. And I asked Bobby if he would call Coach and invite him over for dinner. And if any of you out there in Bruinland know my husband, um, he is, he's of the same ilk and the same ethos as John Wooden is. He's a very kind, sensitive, soft-spoken man. And he's from the South, so I have to do the Southern accent. Um, he says to me, my love, Coach Wooden gets so many offers every day for people that want his time, and he has so many obligations. The last thing he needs on his calendar is another obligation. And I said, <laughs> he can say no. And so the next night, Bobby came home and I said, you call Coach Wooden? And he says, my love. And this went on three weeks. And I don't know whether I wore him down or whether he saw that I really was right and how brilliant this ask would be. But Bobby called Coach Wooden and said, Coach, Coach, you know, I married our women's gymnastics coach. And supposedly Coach Wooden said, I know all about Miss Val. And Bobby said, well, you know, we would love to invite you over for dinner, but coach, we understand the obligations you have on your calendar and how many people want your time. And coach Wooden said, Bobby, I don't mean to interrupt. Are you inviting me over for dinner? Or are you giving me all the reasons that you don't want me to come? And with that, he came over for dinner. He was 87, 88. Um, we had dinner at 5.30 because that is the time I thought octogenarians ate dinner. <laughs> and he stayed until 1130 that night and told story after story after story. And that really was the start of this extremely close relationship that Bobby and I had with Coach Wooden and his daughter till the day, literally the day he died in the UCLA hospital. Um, so the art of the ask is something that I do get into in the book because it, it really is an art form. You need to learn how to ask sincerely without feeling and without coming across that you are entitled. Like Coach Wooden didn't have to say okay to us. We weren't entitled for him to come to dinner. Um, the art of the ask is how to ask for something that you really feel you would love to participate in or love to receive, mm -hmm. um, without being annoying and being entitled. And then if you don't get the answer you want, the real art is in the nudge, how to come mm -hmm. back and <laughs> nudge without being annoying. And then the last part of it is the art of the drop. You just got to learn when to drop it and, and you can come back to it later, but just drop it. And it's interesting. Like, as you can imagine, I get a lot of asks um, from everybody from professionals to young girls that are in, in grade school that want to do a report on me or something like that. And the ones that really sincerely, confidently, but respectfully ask, I always say yes. Cause I just, so cool. Who do you say no to? 
Huh. Which I, Nobody. <laughs> well, well, I blame Shonda Rhimes. Shonda Rhimes is the queen of television. She wrote a book the year I said yes to everything. And so when I read that, I was like, I, I say yes. I honestly say yes. I can't tell you last time I said no. I just feel like if people have the courage to ask, then especially, I love it when, especially young, young athletes in like junior high or high school, when they'll say, Miss Rat, Miss Val, I read your book and I learned about the art of the ask. So I'm making the ask. Of course <laughs> I have to say yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's too successful, the art of the ask. <laughs> it is. It is. The chancellor told me last year that he was adding up all of these speaking engagements that I did for UCLA. Cause of course I'm gonna say yes, UCLA, mm -hmm. any sororities, fraternities, the chancellor's associates, I don't care. Luskin, I say yes. And the chancellor said, you know, Ms. Val, you can say no. And I said, no, I will never say no to UCLA. Ever. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> that's so nice to hear. Yeah. Okay. Um, now I know you have said, uh, openly that you've made some coaching mistakes in your life and um, what were some of these mistakes and how did you turn everything around? Well, um, I think that if you are honest with yourself and you're putting yourself out there in an endeavor that if you're not just sitting on the couch watching soap operas or reruns, you're putting yourself out there in life. You've got to realize you're going to make mistakes until the day you die. Mm -hmm. And so it's really not about making the mistakes. It's about the recovery of the mistake and how to learn to sincerely apologize, humble yourself and do all of that, which I've done a lot in my career. The worst, worst thing I did was in 1990, our senior women's administrator, um, Dr. Judy Holland, called me in her office and asked me to be the head coach. They said, we're making a change. We want you to be the new head coach. And I thought I laughed out loud as soon as she asked me. She says I was catatonic for about a minute. <clears throat> then I laughed out loud. And I reminded her, I didn't know the first thing about gymnastics. I've never done gymnastics. I, I'm like, Dr. Holland, you remember? I, I've never gone upside down. And she basically said to me, I trust you'll figure it out. And the only thing that I knew how to do that I felt I could do was to mimic other coaches. It was the worst decision of my career. And I figured that I grew up on stage acting. I'll just act like other coaches. You know, I just took on their posture and their affect and I can do this. And in my brain, this was the bad part about that was I thought in order to be a successful coach, you had to be dogmatic, you had to be tough talking, tough minded, snarky, your way the highway, just this militaristic dictator. Mm. And that's what I acted like. And we were horrible, the team was horrible, I was horrible. Um, and it, two things happened. One was a few years into it, get this, the entire team asks me for a team meeting and I get excited because I love team meetings. And for two solid hours, they gave me example after example after example of all of the things that I have done that were hurtful to them. Mm. That, that, and they said, and I say, I go into this ex quite extensively in my TED talk, that they, they wanted to be coached up, not torn down. I remember another one saying, Miss Val, we want to be supported, not belittled. Miss Val, your sarcasm is really hurtful and snarky. And for two solid hours, I'm just getting pummeled with all of this. And I remember thinking to myself, okay, I can say, guess what, guys? I'm a head coach, and if you don't like it, you go find yourself another team. Or I can go, okay, what I'm doing is not working because do I, do I really, is this the result that I want? for them all to feel badly about themselves. That's not the job of a coach. My co job is to build them up, lift them up. I need to change. So um, I was on my way to resign, actually. I, I thought about it a lot and I was like, I told Dr. Holland I couldn't do this job. So I went, <laughs> I went in there, but I'm gonna go tell her I'm gonna resign. 
and true story. And this is when they make a movie about my life. This is going to be amazing. I walk through Ackerman Union and I happen upon Coach Wooden's book on leadership. And I just flip through it and it magically opens up to his definition of success. And I read, and I'm sure all of you Bruins out there, we can all recite this. <laughs> love Coach Wooden. Success is peace of mind, which is a direct result in knowing you've done the best of becoming the best that you're capable. He used a lot of words because he was an English major also, but it's basically success is peace of mind in knowing you've done your best. And I thought, this makes no sense. Coach won 10 championships in 12 years. Coaches are hired to win. Success is winning. And I read his definition over and over and over until I had the biggest aha moment of my professional career. Success is peace of mind in knowing you have done your best. And I was like, ding, ding, ding. I had been trying to be somebody else by mimicking all these other coaches all these years. And it was so clear to me in that moment that when you try to mimic and be someone else, you will never be as good at them being them as they are. So you'll always be a second rate them. And the worst part about this is it prevents you from becoming a first rate you, all that you can be. So I did not resign. I went back to the athletic department and that's when I just started thinking, okay, what do I bring to this job? And that's when I started figuring it out. And it really was Coach Wooden's definition of success that flipped it for me. Wow. Yeah. That was really fate that you saw his book in the bookstore and opened it to just the right page. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. All right. Let me ask you... Um, uh, we have oh we have some questions we okay. have a question hannah kong uh, okay. class of 2017 and hannah asks can you share an example of when you've changed course or paths in your life when others advised against it oh that's good mm. that's really good hannah thank you um yes a few things come to mind first of all my dad is an artist um and when I graduated from high school, it was just understood that you go to college. I mean, there was no question, you go to college. And I was trying to, I was going to college and I was still dancing. And my dad being an artist understood that juxtaposition of how those two things were not gonna work at the same time. And he, he talked to me and he said, do you love to dance? And I said, I do. And he said, well, you can't, give a hundred percent to dance and a hundred percent to your collegiate career. You got to choose one and you can always go back to school, but you're not always going to be able to dance. And with that, he, it's like he gave me permission to not feel guilty about going to college right out of high school. And I remember, I remember some snarky comments about um, that. I was 20, 21, 22 and not gone to college yet not gone to college period period and people are like oh you you haven't been to college i'm like nope but it was okay because i was living my dream and and i was going to dance as long as i as i could um the other thing that came to mind when hannah asked this brilliant question was so i get to ucla my freshman year and i'm 22 years old and my mom gets diagnosed with colon cancer no, 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 I'm sorry. Becca, Becca, Becca. Okay, that's, that's not right. <laughs> Freshman year, I get a gut. No, that's true. I'm sorry. I'm mixing up my mom. Okay. She had had cancer before I got to college. It was gone. Hmm. Freshman year, I get a gut feeling about January, February that I want to go to Greece, back to Greece, back to the village, my parents' village. Hmm with both of my parents and I want to go in April. Something's in my gut saying yeah, April. So now my, my academic advisor, Dr. Holland, my parents, my friends, that coaches, everybody is telling me 
you're already late going back to college, to school, you're a freshman at 22 years old, finish out the year and go to Greece after the year in June. Something inside of me was like, no, I want to go in April. It's, it's Easter. It's like the most, it's the most important holiday of, of the country. I want to go then. And we go to Greece. My mother starts losing her speech in Greece. We come back a week to the day we get back from Greece. She has diagnosed with a brain tumor and she has brain surgery. So something in me was telling me it doesn't matter what anyone else is saying. Your gut is telling you to go to Greece with your parents. And had I not done that, um, my mom would have never gotten back to Greece um, to see her family. And she got to say, and like we didn't know she was going to die. She got to say goodbye to her family. And then three years later, my senior year, she got really, really ill. And I took a year off of school again to go home and take care of her. And I actually remember, not a lot of people, but I remember some people saying, I can't believe they would say this. You know, I know this is cruel, but your mom's probably gonna die anyway. So um, why don't you just finish your school and you can go up after that? I was like, okay, no, that may be how you deal with your family, uh-uh. So I got to spend, you know, my mom's last days with her because I said, no, I'm dropping out of school again. Go take care of my mom. And, um, you know, this whole session, Wendy, is called, what we're doing right now is called Choreograph Your Life. Mm -hmm. Choreography, Bruins, is, it's not dance steps to music. Choreography is any intentional movement. And... I love the, the image that that brings up and that conjures up. When you choreograph your life, you're taking charge of your life and you're not waiting for life to happen to you and you're not waiting for people to tell you what to do in your life. So with all of those decisions, I truly choreographed my life and I have no regrets. Absolutely. All right, well, we have a, our next question from Steve Smith class of 1972 and Steve wants to know what were your three most defining habits that contributed to your personal success three most defining habits oh that's a good one too Steve first of all I'm envious that you got to be at UCLA when coach Wooden was still coaching so mm -hmm. uh three habits well first of all the first very first thing that comes to mind is I have a growth mindset um, I think that people that feed a lot in their fields continue to grow and they're not stuck or fixed in their ways. And so I have, uh, I'm a voracious reader and I love, 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 love learning. Um, so that's something that has propelled me throughout my whole career. Um, I've always said that one of the greatest gifts I had, uh, coming in as a head coach, once I figured out really what I was going to, why I was going to coach and not stop mimicking other people. But one of the greatest gifts I had was I didn't know anything. So I had to ask a lot of questions and the repercussions of that, the ripple effect of asking questions, A, it empowered my assistant coaches. So they felt appreciated. Um, it, it empowered the student athletes that when I was teaching a skill on balance beam and I just couldn't see it and I would call over one of the girls and ask her to, to coach it, then that girl is now invested in her teammate's success. So that was brilliant. Um, and I was able to model humility for the whole program as the leader. So the fact that I, I had to ask a hundred questions every day, I have, I have always felt was one of my greatest gifts coming into, um, the third thing was the third, uh, I would say the third thing is to really continue to hit the refresh button and tap into your why, why, 
are you doing what you're doing? And I tapped into my why right after I read Coach Wynn's definition of success. Mm -hmm. And I went back and figured out what I brought to the table. And then I thought to myself, but why do you even want a coach? And I, again, it was so clear to me. It's like, there are coaches, there are athletic departments, there are athletes and there are fans that only care about winning. Mm. And to me, that was like, they only care about bragging rights, being able to say, ha ha, we beat you. And that never resonated with me because I did not grow up in the world of athletics. So if that didn't resonate, if winning, like if I really care about that much about winning, then why was I going to do this? And it was like, well, duh, because sport is a masterclass in teaching really, really, really tough life lessons that you don't learn in the classroom especially sport of gymnastics that takes such determination and focus to be able to stay on those four inches, right. Of balance beam. Mm. And my why was I'm going to develop champions in life through sport. I'm going to focus on the whole person that is the athlete. I'm not going to just focus on the athlete. I'm going to focus on this whole person and I'm going to fortify this whole young woman into being a superhero that's gonna go out in the world and change the world and make it a better place. And if I can do that really well, I knew that that would translate to the competition floor and we would win. Mm. And obviously I was able to recruit very well because I'm at UCLA. Mm -hmm. um, Coach Wooden always said, you can't win without talent, which is very true. But my why has never shifted from that. And so getting back to the question is, I mean, there were times that my assistant coaches that were extremely accomplished in the sport of gymnastics did not understand or agree with some of the things I was doing. I mean, I had very unorthodox ways of, of, of coaching, but I would always tap back into my why. My, okay, my, I'm, in a, I'm developing champions in life through sport. So nope, this is more important than that. Nope, we're going to take, a full day off before competitions so their bodies can heal, their minds can heal, they can rest. Mm -hmm. And it's like, that was unheard of. You don't take a day off before <laughs> gymnasts. In fact, growing up, these gymnasts do two workouts a day before the day of the competition. Oh, a workout the day of the competition. I was like, nope, mm -hmm. we're taking the whole day off before. And they were like, mm, uh, I'm like, nope, we are. Because I want this whole human being to be refreshed. And anyway, Tap into your why and stay true to it. Your why, your North Star. Don't ever veer off from that North Star. Very nice. Okay. Uh, we've got another question here. You are an award-winning coach, and we have some people who are struggling mentally and emotionally to take the next step in their professional careers. What advice would you give these Bruins to get them unstuck? That's a great question. Mm -hmm. These questions are really good. Mm -hmm. I, I have not gotten any of these questions before. Um, first of all, please understand that you, if you've been in your career, you have not only the wisdom of all of your years of the things that didn't work and the things that do work, but you also have established work habits that take years and years and years to hone that a 20 something year old doesn't have. So don't discount what you bring to the table, either in the current job that you're in or in a new endeavor that you would like to pursue. Um, and I feel that especially these last three months, I just have felt such a calling to reestablish my calling what reestablish your calling. What is that? What is it about your job that you love? And hit the refresh button on that. Um, it's also a great time right now to reinvent yourself. You know, take the things that you do well and figure out how we can put that out into the world. Redefine yourself. 
And I like to think of this big refresh button that we all have inside of ourselves that we kind of lose track of our calling, our why, our North Star, our, our moral compass. Hit that refresh button. And just like on a computer, when you hit the refresh button on a computer, it disposes of all the junk, but it keeps the important stuff. And I would take, and during, as you're, as you're having this time with yourself, this mindful, intentional time, I really would take notes on all of the habits and the things that you have honed over the years that you do very, very well. Your work ethic, your honesty, your respect for others, the fact that you choose to show up every day in a good mood. You know, whatever those are, and don't discount those because, though, like I said before, those are things that the younger, younger generation hopefully will get in the, ne in the next decade two decades that they're working as well. But right now they don't have them. They can't bring that to the table like you can. I've heard so many times or I've read so many times where people, um, owners will hire an elderly employee over a newbie because they know that elderly employee is going to be bringing the work ethic. He's going to, he understands that showing up 10 minutes early is, is on time. And that showing up on time is late. He understands all those little things. Absolutely. Okay, um, we have another question you shared with us about asking Coach Wooden to dinner. And Celine Vitarni, Celine, I hope I'm not mispronouncing your name, but Celine Vitarni from the class of 2018 asks, how can one initiate interactions that become meaningful relationships or mentorships long-term? Yeah, that's a good one too. I've had uh, a lot of people ask how to get a mentor. And I had inarguably the greatest mentor that's ever lived in, in Coach John Wooden. Um, but the important thing to remember is once again, to master the art of ask. A mentor is not gonna call you up to hang out with you. You need to call the mentor. Like I spent oodles of time with Coach Wooden, but he never called me up to say, hey, do you wanna to go to the basketball game with me? Hey, you wanna drive me to a football game? Hey, do you wanna come over for dinner? I called him up. And I've had, I've had people, young men and women, um, ask me to mentor them. And the ones that are respectful of my time, I, I am mentors to the people that have all these qualities. They're very respectful of my time. They ask in a way that they don't, it, they don't seem like they're entitled. And even one of them is so cute. She, she'll call me up and she'll say, Miss Val, I know that you've got so many people that are asking for your time. Can I just, like, you probably don't have time to get all your, your errands done. Can, can I go pick up your laundry and some groceries and whatever? Mm. And she asked me at a time that I was so overwhelmed. I actually said, yeah. I was like, my, here, here's what I need from the grocery store and here's where my laundry is. And then when she brought it over, I said, come on in, let's, let's sit down and have some lunch. I would have never invited her over to have lunch with me. But the fact that she didn't make it about herself really spoke volumes to me. It was very enterprising of her. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, we've got a question here from Stacy Raskin, Stacy from the class of 2003. And she says, how do you start something new if you're not sure of all the steps. That's the fun part, Stacy. Come <laughs> on, you're not gonna know all the steps. How, how can you start something new and know the steps? That's an oxymoron, okay? So the fun part is figuring out the steps. And there's two keys, okay? The cornerstones of Coach Wooden's Pyramid of Success, industriousness, hard work, and enthusiasm. You put those two things together and you get magic. And Again, I'm going to go back to what I said when I first started coaching was don't pretend like you know everything. Okay. You don't. Nobody's expecting you to. Learn how to fall without formulating a judgment on yourself. The greatest athletes in the world, this is something that I've detected with them, is that when they fall, when they can make a mistake, when a quarterback misses a pass, whatever, they don't spend any time judging themselves. Instead of 
They just look at a bit like an evaluation. Well, that didn't work. What I need to do better next time. So master that art of falling. I'm not going to say failure because I don't believe in the word failure. We'll get into that another time. But master not just picking yourself up, but picking yourself up with the proper intention of learning from what you did before the fall. And honestly, this is the fun part. Life, life is not a journey. You know that those Hallmark cards that say life is a journey? Life is not a journey. Life is an adventure. And it's filled with boulders and streams and earthquakes and all these things. And the really, really fun part about it is figuring out how to get around the boulder, up and over or through it, whatever it is, that is life. And so if you've got a new adventure you want to go on, a new venture, embrace the adventure part. Of, that's a good one. That should be a homework card. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Miss Val, we've got time for one more prepared question. Okay. Uh, until we um, turn it over and um, answer some of our Q&A questions. So uh, this last prepared question is from Joyce Short from the class of 1986. And Joyce says, I enjoy what I do, but I feel like I'm burning out. How can I reignite my passion and motivation? So how would you advise Joyce and others that are more experienced in their careers to reignite their passion and motivation? That's, I love that question because it means that Joyce, you're humble. You're, you're, you're able to admit that you're just not on top of your game. And um, that doesn't mean that you need to do something else. It just means that we need to once again hit that refresh button. Um, something that I do with our team that uh, I taught a class this last quarter, a graduate class, the School of Ed Education. And there were 10 graduate students in this class. And halfway through the quarter, I felt kind of like you did. I was like, I just kind of feel like I'm going through the motions. And so we played a little game called keep it up, step it up. And I asked every one of the students to tell me what they felt I should keep up, what was a good part of what I was doing, and then step it up, how I could do something better. Mm -hmm. And if you have people in, is this Joyce I'm talking to? Mm -hmm. Is this Joyce? Yeah. If yes. you have people in your circle at work, you know, five or six of you go to lunch one day and play, keep it up, step it up and go around where every person sits in the hot seat and every other person tells them, keep it up. And most of the time it's like the same, you hear the same stuff and the keep it up, especially, but the step it up is really, really good. And those are the, usually when, when you will get a different response from people and it's important not to get bristly, don't get stern in your posture, <laughs> don't excuses, don't say, oh, well, this is why I do this. Just take it in because it's important that we always allow ourselves to see how we are being perceived by other people, even if we don't agree with how they're perceiv perceiving us. Um, so keep it up, step up is fun. Another thing, which is kind of like that same thing, but um, is, and leadership coaches do this a lot. I think it's called a 365 review or something like that. Um, probably a lot of you have done this. You go to five people that know you really, 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 really well. And you ask them to tell you what it looks like to them when you're at your best and what it looks like, how you look to them when you get tripped up when you're not at your best, when you're stressed out. And you can have them respond to you face-to-face -face, or you can have them write it. Um, I hired a leadership coach uh, 10 years before I retired and mm -hmm. I had the five people, I just had them email me because um, I figured that their answers would be a little bit more thoughtful. And it was great, great feedback um, as to what I look like and what my actions look like when I get when I'm not at my best, when I'm stressed out. Um, so that's one way. Those are two ways. Um, also, I think all of us, I don't think, I know all of us, we, every single person in life has a little bit of a competitiveness in them. We all have this competitive, competitive thing in us. 
And that's why I've always believed it's really important in life to set goals and long-term goals. And then you break it down into short-term goals and then you break it down into daily goals. And the important part is to make sure you celebrate those small victories that don't just blow them off. Like even if my, my goal today is to drink 10 glasses of water instead of eight glasses of water. When I drink those 10, do a little happy dance and give yourself a little atta girl. I'm like, yeah. Um, it's, it's really important. And then also when you're setting your goals, if you don't achieve a goal, going back to what I said earlier, don't formulate a judgment on yourself. Just figure out why you didn't achieve the goal and then what you need to do, if, even if you want to keep the goal. Maybe you don't want to keep that goal. Maybe you want to change your goal. Um, but if you can, if we all can, those of us in our forties, fifties, sixties now, I just, I want to spend the rest of my life continuously hitting my interpersonal refresh button, getting rid of the stuff that is not serving me well, the people that aren't serving me well, the social media stuff that's not serving me well, getting rid of the, the dialogue that I've had with myself for so long it's become habit. If it's not serving me, get rid of it and start planting new seeds. And that's basically what I did these last three months. I've, I've given myself the sorry excuse that I don't have time to work on my quiet time. I don't have time to work on um, learning how to be mindful. And I've always wanted to learn to be able to meditate and breathing meditation. Oh, I don't have time for that, which is a lie. Um, <laughs> but I mean, I'm in my 60s now, and I actually think that my 60s are going to be my best decade because I've taken this last three months with COVID intentionally to improve my life, to not just go through it, but to grow through it. And, um, I totally got off track with what the question was. I apologize. You gave us a lot of great information anyway, so don't apologize. <laughs> okay, we've got, we have a couple more questions, uh, Ms. Val, and we only have a few more minutes, so um, maybe we could get through them like quickly and, and okay. answer them both. Yeah. Okay, so from Roxanne Tinnenbang, uh, Roxanne says, what advice do you have to choreograph your life for someone who lacks the confidence to do so? Okay. <laughs> First of all, there's never been another you, okay, in the nine billion people that have graced planet Earth, there's never been another you. What was her name? Roxanne. Roxanne, come on, right here. There's never been another you. And Roxanne, when you die, there will never be another you. You are here for a reason, okay? That light, that energy inside of you is unique to you, it's never, ever been on planet Earth. So take a little breath and realize you don't have to have this massive platform to really do good things in, in, in your day, to make a positive influence on someone during your day, okay? It takes courage. Courage, my definition of courage, you can think about this, is taking a step toward your goal without any guarantee of a result. Because if you knew the result, you wouldn't have to, to muster up courage, right? So things in life that don't take courage, they're not that much fun. They're mundane. They're same old, same old. The things that really are meaningful take courage. But every person on the planet is in the same position. We all have to muster the courage to take that step toward our goal confidently without any guarantee of the, of the result. And I'm, I'm gonna just ask you, what's the worst thing that can happen? Either the person that you're asking will say no. Who cares? Don't take it personally. They don't even know you. Or you might wanna try free skydiving or something like that and you may break your leg okay so what you did it okay great you may want to change careers scary 
All right. But you know what? Do it with, in, with proper intention. Learn about it. Set a plan. Set a big goal. Set smaller goals and celebrate your small victories. And don't forget to pat yourself on the back. And this is the, this is the number one thing that I think all humans struggle with. And I know for a fact, this was the, the big thing in coaching to get athletes to stop with the negative inner dialogue. Mm. Tearing yourself down mentally will never, ever get you one step closer to your goal. And if you continue to choose to do it, then basically you're just looking for an excuse in and out not to have to want to do that goal in the first place. So choose a new goal. I just went on the spell on you. <laughs> okay, we have just a couple more minutes, Miss Fell, for one more question. Uh, this is from Candice Yokomizo. Hi, Candice. Uh, she says, what advice do you have for new graduates who are starting out their life during this difficult time? Ah, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Just understand, first of all, everybody is in the same boat, okay? Second of all is any, all, all jobs are about relationships and who you know. And so it is about networking. It is it about, it is about bringing yourself fully to any conversation, whether it's over the phone or an email or text or whatever. And I, if you're emailing me, I should be able to feel your energy and your enthusiasm come off that page. Um, and don't put yourself in a box that this is what you got your degree in. So this is what I'm going to do because the truth is with your skill set, with your personality, with the things that interest you, you could do 10, 20, 30 different jobs. Like I could have been a teacher, a ballet teacher, a school teacher. I mean, I could have done so many things that take the skills that I have honed as a coach. And um, I feel like one of the, the things that we all do that are, is a disservice is we put ourselves on this little path that I'm supposed to be this, and this is what I graduated in, so this is what I'm going to do. And by doing that, we become blind to opportunities that open up that, because we're so micro-focused on this. So don't allow yourself to be micro-focused. Be macro-focused. Cast a wide net. And quite honestly, take whatever comes your way because you never know who you're going to meet, what other avenue it's going to open. You never know. Great. All right. I think that wraps up our questions. Um, I have a question for you, Ms. Bell, and that is, where can people find you if they want to order your book? Oh, oh thank you. Um, okay, <laughs> I have a website. It's called officialmissval.com, and that's where I put up my musings. They're called musings because when I first started them, everybody said you should blog, and I didn't think I was cool enough or hip enough to blog, so I call them musings, things I think about. Um, but if you go to the store, I have my book, but I also have a bunch of Miss Val swag. And I'm so glad you asked, Wendy, when, Wendy because I wanna show you all something. Okay, so this is my cool little scarf, right? Mm -hmm. And it has my logo, which is the heart. My dad actually painted the heart. And it has my signature, it says Miss Val. So isn't this cool and hip? get this cute i'm walking i'm walking oh i have a mask <laughs> and then i get home and i'm walking and sweaty because i've been out walking and oh look it's a hairband <laughs> so you can buy these on my website officialmisspell.com and the best part about this my book all my swag which is really cool stuff like it's really really good material well made all of the profits go to helping girls who have been rescued from sex trafficking. And so I'm very, very proud to be ignited with them. And we've sold like, we've only had these for about two weeks. I've already sold 120 of them on the website. So go get them. They're, they're awesome. Did you see that? Did you see this? Just, and they, and they stay up. They're made really well. Okay. Very cute. I'm going to have to get one. <laughs> They're $15. Online, you buy stuff like this for like 28 bucks. $15. Very cute. Okay, everybody. Well, I think that wraps up our first session of Choreograph Your Life with Miss Val. 
Um, I hope you were as inspired by Miss Val as I was. I always am. And um, I hope, well, I hope that you'll all join us for our next session, which is going to talk about uh, the feedback process and how, how you can learn to inspire and lead others. So that next session is going to be Tuesday, July 21st at 5 p.m. So I hope you'll join us for that important topic. And um, thank you all for joining us today. We'll see you next month and go Bruins. Go Bruins.